Hello and welcome to Nature Live Online, the show where we bring the Natural History Museum in London straight to your homes. From the dinosaurs in our galleries to the giant squid in our basement, join us for a chat with museum scientists, but also with museums from all around the world. Today, in fact, we're looking at some life forms that uh, we tend to overlook, even though they are everywhere. We're going to be looking at lichens. And as always, as we chat, send in your comments and questions because we love for, to hear from you. I've already seen some questions already on the chat, so please keep sending them through. Now, to talk about lichens, uh, we are really, really lucky to be joined today by uh, at NHM Natural History Museum Associate, Dr. Holger Tuz, who is now the curator of lichens, slime molds, algae and bryophytes at the Stuttgart Estate Museum of Natural History in Germany. And as I said before, scientific associate of the Natural History Museum. And uh, also Dr. Stari Heitmarsen, who is a lichenologist at the Icelandic Institute of Natural History and who is visiting Holger in Stuttgart at the moment. Hi, Holger, and hi, Stari. Hello, nice to see you. Hi, hi. Hello, so, so, so uh, glad that you were able to join us today. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, now, without any further ado, and we hope because we are already getting questions from our viewers, Let's start talking about lichens. Holger, can you tell us uh, what are lichens? And in fact, I'm going to ask you to, after telling us what lichens are, asking the, the first questions that we got from our audience, which is how do algae and fungi join together and ma make lichens? And how long does it take? This question was from Archie, uh, who is watching from YouTube. But tell us a little bit more about lichens. I think Archie's question gave it away a little bit. Yeah, well, actually, um... The easiest thing to imagine what a lichen looks like is uh, at this time of the year to simply take a look out of the window. The leaves from the canopy of the trees are down and we see very often um, there are yellow color patches uh, in the canopy on the trunks. That is already a lichen and a lichen um, that is basically a lifestyle um, by a fungus who has uh, the ability to live together with other organisms, particularly also with algae. It's a little bit like a, um, a flat sharing where you've got the fungus uh, as the main uh, inhabitant and then uh, at fluctuating uh, rates, uh, other inhabitants. And uh, this is actually also part of the answer to um, the question from the audience. Um, so the algae can actually change in a lichen and there are fungi who steal the algal partners from other lichens and then develop their own uh, flat sharing um, based on the stolen algae. In other cases, it's really that uh, a fungal spore, they disperse by spores, and then they have to have good luck to find a compatible, a suitable partner in the open, um, which can be a challenge. So many lichens actually do then uh, algal sharing as well, and they uh, get in contact with algae, which are already there from the leftovers of other lichens. That's brilliant. Now, um, Holger and Stary, I think people who know lichens, they might have heard that, that yeah, they are um, uh, a, a relationship between a fungus and an algae. Uh, but you were telling me that, and Holger, I think you mentioned it, that it's not only algae, they're all the organisms that can be part of a lichen. So Stary, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What are those other organisms? Well, it's also known that it's not only a question about uh, green algae, as is uh, most usually the uh, the case with lichens, uh, that is the photosynthetic partner of the lichen, it can also be cyanobacteria. But uh, fairly recently, in the last few decades, we have been uh, revealing more and more bacteria that's uh, growing within the symbiosis. And in some cases, most probably uh, having some effect on it. Well, I mean, uh, lichens just as, as other organs, organisms can be attacked by, uh, by bacteria that are saprophic or, or um, causing some diseases, etc. But they can also have some role to play in the symbiosis and maybe making life a little bit easier or, or harder in some cases, or maybe keeping off some of the other more hostile bacteria that might be attacking them. 
And, That's yeah, and, yeah, and you can see on the on the picture uh, down right there, uh, there are some bacterial colonies that uh, came from a lichen that was collected down at the seashore, uh, close to where I'm working in, in Akureyri. This was done by a colleague of mine, uh, Margaret Ödu Sigurbjörsdóttir. And there were quite a number of species that were culturable, because that's also often the problem when you are looking at microbes growing in the lichen that they might not be culturable on the media we are offering them. That's incredible. That's what I was going to ask you. The pictures that we're seeing at the moment, they are the different elements of lichens growing separately, but that's not that simple to, to achieve, is it, Stari? No, not all, no. But of course, well, we, we are we are facing uh, the the enjoyable problem of uh, molecular uh, century now that we we have actually well, you could say that we have uh, more uh, we almost have more answers than questions in some cases. <laughs> <laughs> we have this enormous amount of data, and we often need to uh, connect this data to some real uh, organisms. We, we know about all these bacteria maybe that are growing in and around the lichens, but we only are capable of uh, culturing a little part of it. And that, that makes it really hard for us. And we really have to be uh, scrutinizing this into details if we want to really know what it is that we are observing. So we are not drawing our own conclusions, for example. That actually links a little bit with, with my next question, Stavi, um, but I'm actually going to send to, to Holger. But I was going to ask you, are there many kinds of li lichens? And do we actually know how many kinds of lichens are in the world? Is it easy to know, Holger? Can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about that? Well, the answer is a little bit um, complicated because um, a lichen is a system with many components. So it is usual that uh, we kind of tend to simplify things uh, by uh, giving a name, a scientific name um, of a lichen to only one of the components. And that is uh, the main inhabitant um, who provides the structure that is uh, uh, usually one dominating fungus, so the lichenized fungus. Um, and uh, in terms of lichenized fungi, we estimate that there are about 18 to 20,000 species currently described, formally described with a proper scientific name. But um, we also have estimates from about 20 to 30% 30, 30 of all fungi worldwide to have the ability to um, live as a lichen. And if we then look at figures which say that there may be around 1.5 to almost 4 million species of fungi on the planet, um, then we can easily calculate that uh, we know about 20,000 uh, species of lichenized fungi so far, but there may be hundreds of thousands still to be discovered. That's incredible. Uh, that's a really, really high number and, and, and a lot to find out, which I, I suppose, yeah, as I said before, there's, as Stadi was saying, many answers but not enough questions and more questions to come about about these, these amazing organisms. Um, this is another question. I'm going to send it to Stari in, um, since uh, you're from Iceland, Stari. Where can we find them? Can we find them in your uh, country, for example? Yes, there are. there is quite a number of uh, lichens in Iceland and actually if we compare them to the vascular plant flora uh, in Iceland, we have more species of, of lichens known in in Iceland compared to that. But that's also uh, what we uh, what we often see that the more uh, the higher you get in the mountains or further to the north, then they get more prominent. They are more visible as part of the of the overall landscape, if you say so. And walking around in Iceland you find one and see lichens almost everywhere. It's in particular maybe in the wetlands and the mires that you hardly see lichens. You have some uh, Peltigeras growing there on the on the tussocks, but otherwise there are few. But if you get into the heathlands, uh, there you find a lot of both reindeer lichens and the and cetera Icelandica, or which is called Iceland moss. And on the stones, we have a lot of Saxicolos lichens growing on the on the stones. That's brilliant. But even though they're more prominent, the higher we go. Um... In, in height and also latitude, they're also found uh, in other places in, in around the world. Is that right, Holger? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, if you look in uh, historical textbooks, then there's a, a take home message always that lichens are dominant in Nordic countries and high up in the mountains. But that's mainly due to the fact that there's nothing else to see. Um, <laughs> so there are no trees um, which uh, somehow divert the view. Um, but if you look into a, a forest uh, in uh, Central Europe, but also in the tropics, if you go into a, a rainforest, what you actually see is usually not the trees directly, but you're looking on trunks which are covered in lichens. And uh, the typical picture of a tropical rainforest tree with uh, different patches of different colors, these patches of different colors, that's usually lichens with a few mosses uh, on top, but um, predominantly it's lichens. And what we have learned during the last few decades is that the species diversity in tropical rainforests has hugely been underestimated. And this is where uh, almost every week there are new species being described from very very busy colleagues in tropical countries. So this is really uh, like a new bonanza in lichen uh, describing. That's brilliant. Uh, it's, it's good to know that everywhere and that we just need to pay a little bit more attention. Maybe don't get distracted by the, the other plants and animals that are around. Just just look at, at the at the little bit. Now, Holger, Stanley, we've been getting loads of questions from our audience, which I think is, is fantastic. Uh, Rachel, we've got one question from Rachel about eating lichens, and I'm going to hold that until later because we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but Helen on Facebook were, was asking, how long does lichens life live for? How long can they last for? Uh, Holger, I'm going to go uh, to you with that one. Yeah, it's actually not a trivial question because um, you can see outside there in the wild objects which last for decades, in some case even centuries, which can be shown by photographs or by our paintings. Uh, so we know that um, these objects can get quite old, but very often as a lichen grows, it's um, the outer um, parts which continue to grow on while the central part uh, dies off. So you've got a centrifugal um, a circle like um, a structure. And uh, in terms of identity, it's a quite uh, interesting question. What is one single lichen? Um, are the parts which get fragmented at the margins, do they still count as one single lichen or have they um, multiplied in uh, hundreds of uh, individuals. So uh, to say how old is then this colony um, is not exactly the same as saying um, how old is the individual lichen. So we are in a kind of a um, difficult business there. Absolutely. That's, a, that's an excellent answer for a, a question that seems simple, but not so simple. Um, we got another question as well from Artie as well, who had asked before. And we're going to send that to, well, to Stari and Holger, but let's start with Stari. How many, how many lichenologists are there and how do you become one? Uh, that, I think that's a difficult question as well. But Stari, do we know how many lichenologists since you're one of them? But how do you become one? Well, uh... There are ways to count the lichenologists. They are not too many. That's that's the correct answer, at least. But uh, just as with uh, species counting, it can also dis uh, uh, depend a little bit on how we define a lichenologist. But we are lucky to be uh, part of a guild, you could say, Holger and me, lichenologists, <laughs> that uh, we meet uh, every fourth year on a big international uh, conference. And unlike some other disciplines, we kind of uh, encounter everything that has with lichen to do as a lichenologist. So it doesn't matter if you're in the physiology or in the molecular uh, biology or if you are an ecologist, but if lichens are your subject, then you're a lichenologist. And I would guess that we are talking about several hundreds, uh, even plus minus uh, 1000 or something like that. Holger may correct me if he has a, <laughs> has a more correct answer to that. And but then to to get become an lichenologist, well, there are many ways I would guess, and uh, uh, it's easy to start to study lichens on your own with the help of both the internet and uh, textbooks, etc. You need a good hand lens, and in the continuation, you need dissecting microscope and a microscope for if you want to be able to to identify them. But that's a way of of doing it. But 
both for me and Holger, we we went into painstaking uh, university studies to <laughs> to become what we what we ended up. <laughs> That's really interesting. I love that you said that even though Holger and yourself went to university to study them, you can actually do it on, on yourself. Holger, anything to add to that? Well, actually, uh, one important thing is that uh, most countries have actually um, uh, learned societies which are dedicated to lichens, where both professional lichenologists and amateur lichenologists, um, it doesn't actually mean that one knows more than the other necessarily. Um, and uh, there are many, many privateers uh, who uh, are excellent lichenologists. Um, so uh, if you are interested in lichens, uh, uh, looking out for um, uh, lichen societies, such as the British Lichen Society is always a very good idea. And such uh, societies exist in many countries worldwide now. Um, there are also sometimes opportunities to uh, participate in citizen science projects. Um, again, in the UK, there had been the famous Opal air quality surveys. And this is also how some people then get into lichens. And once hooked, um, they can't stop anymore. I started as a uh, well, uh, pre-lichenologist uh, in school, actually, when I did uh, air quality studies there at a very basic level. And then it never left me somehow. <laughs> I worked with all sorts of organisms uh, in the meantime, but somehow I always returned to uh, lichenology. And now I'm being paid for it, at least partly uh, to do this <laughs> sort of research. <laughs> once you know the lichens, yeah. once you know the lichens, that's it, you're hooked for life. Uh, one last question before we move on. Uh, we had a question from Andy who was asking, what gives lichens the vast range of colors? Holger, do we have an answer to that? Or is it something that we still find out? Well, it's uh, actually, um, again, a complex question. There are many, many um, uh, chemical substances which contribute to colors, but very often there are also physical structures. So the distribution of air-filled spaces and how that uh, um, changes when uh, the lichen gets wet, that can change the colors dramatically. You will, everybody can see that quite easily. A twig um, with lichen cover in dry weather looks completely different compared to it when it is uh, wet because then uh, many of the fungal tissues became transparent and you see basically the green of the uh, green algae shimmering through. So it's a complex uh, interplay actually between chemical substances and uh, just physical structures. That's a, a great uh, answer, Holger. We had more questions coming in and please keep sending them through. But um, I'll get to them uh, as they fit really nicely with other questions I'm going to ask them. Um, I wanted to move on, Stary and Holger, into talking about the importance of lichens because they might get overlooked. It might be something that we don't pay attention to, but they're really, really important. So Holger, can you tell us a little bit more why they are important for the environment? Yeah, well, there are uh, direct effects such as um, uh, animals uh, feeding um, on lichens, particularly during winter time. And um, very famous, of course, is the reindeer, which consumes quite a lot of reindeer lichen um, during winter. But uh, it's actually a global phenomenon. Um, there are small deer species in the Himalayas who feed on uh, lichens during winter. In southern China, there are even monkeys who rely on lichens uh, when uh, there's uh, high snow in the mountains. Um, and of course, uh, independent on the season, there are many small animals uh, such as uh, caterpillars of moth. There are um, uh, many um, uh, um, uh, springtails and snails. Uh, snails can be a nightmare for lichen taxonomists because they always modify um, the way the lichens look and uh, we are then puzzled what it could have been. Uh, so there are many animals depending directly as a diet, but there are also animals who rely on lichens to hide. And uh, because usually trees are covered in lichens if it is a healthy forest, um, many lichens, uh, many animals mimic uh, the appearance of lichens. And uh, if the lichens disappear, then these animals stick out uh, immediately and can uh, be hunted by their predators. So uh, also for that reason, the presence of lichens is essential for animals which have evolved to mimic lichens. 
That's that's brilliant. It's something that we might not consider, and it's just it's just incredible to hear about that. Uh, now, Stary, I'm gonna move to you because it's not only an, uh, uh, the the animals that live in the wild that eat uh, lichens. Uh, we humans, human animals, we also eat consume lichens, don't we? And it's important for us. Yes, and uh, they have also been used for dyeing uh, wool throughout the centuries, but uh, I could share a little bit uh, the, uh, the use we have of lichens in, in Iceland. And actually, I only have to go one or two generations above me. And then people were quite used to consume considerable amounts of uh, Cetrari Islandica or Iceland moss, as it's commonly, as its common name is. And uh, earlier, Two, three hundred years ago, Icelanders went out, uh, collected a lot of uh, Cetrari Islandica in the in the summertime, usually uh, using the light nights uh, in June when you had the dew uh, lying on the ground. And then it's easier to collect the lichens when they are a little bit wet, not too wet. And uh, at that time, this was used as a supplement for flour uh, in the in the Icelandic cuisine, you could say, and they were using it uh, for baking bread and also uh, cooking uh, soup out of it. And I myself, well, both my grandmothers, they used to feed me with uh, lichen soup made out of uh, Cetra Islandica and, and milk, and which is quite, quite good soup, I would say, although I'm failing in, in uh, making the appetite in my children for this fantastic course, unfortunately. Oh, that's that's a that's a wonderful story. Um, now, Holger, uh, it's not only in uh, in Iceland that uh, uh, lichens are used for yeah. uh, as as food as as they are consumed. Is that right? Yeah, there's actually a quite interesting pattern because uh, in large parts of Europe, lichens had always been a part of the um, diet uh, when there were famines. Um, and that reflected basically also times when the yield of agricultural processes were um, rather um, low. Um, and it's um, today in modern agriculture with lots of fertilizer being applied that the lichen becomes a rarity and uh, people instead are um, quite well fed, sometimes even uh, too much uh, food consuming. Um, so there is a, a connection between um, poor soils and poor um, uh, alimentation and the use of lichens in Europe. Uh, in other parts of the world, it's quite uh, different. There, lichens are seen as a delicacy. Um, and uh, in uh, parts of uh, India, for example, they are an important um, spice. Um, uh, which is traded internationally. Um, I often, when I used uh, to look for tropical lichens in London, I went uh, simply to an Indian supermarket and there I had a big choice of um, lichens which were um, uh, offered there for curries, for soups, and um, there's a large variety, which of course is also kind of a, um, can become a sustainability issue because these lichens cannot be cultivated. They are harvested from the wild. And uh, just as you um, shouldn't really collect uh, Iceland moss in Britain or in uh, Germany, um, in Iceland it might be different because there you've got these open, unfertilized areas. Perhaps Dari can uh, tell us a little bit about sustainability on I in Iceland moss harvesting in your home country. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, actually, earlier, I know they had this uh, rule of thumb that uh, people were going to the same places in approximately five years, which was considered uh, a long time enough for the lichens to, to recover. But on the other hand, I would not maybe try to claim that we Icelanders uh, are masters of, of uh, uh, of doing this sustainably uh, concerning that. But the Cetrari Islantica is still quite uh, common and easily found in, in many places. I suppose it's, it's really important to, to talk about the sustainability thing because they 
they grow in the wild, but it's really difficult to cultivate them. It's not that we can grow uh, uh, fields of, of lichens ourselves. So that's why it becomes really different and uh, difficult. And um, I want to talk a little bit about that, about the pressures, the environmental pressures that they are, they are suffering or the human pressures. But we had a, a question from Sophie as well. Um, they were asking, is a variety of lichens a sign of good air quality? And I think this come from lately, lichens have been in, in vogue a lot because of they were uh, air quality biomarkers is this is this correct uh Holger? well it was correct when we had sulfur dioxide the main um, pollutant from coal burning in the past um, uh, sulfur dioxide was a killer and uh, there was really an almost linear um, relation between uh, uh, concentration of this pollutant and lichen diversity today it's more complex because today our dominant uh, air pollutant in europe are uh, nitrogen compounds and uh, they favor some lichens while many others are suffering from too much nitrogen compounds. So actually you do get sometimes a, a pattern where you have higher species numbers in areas with high or moderate nitrogen um, uh, uh, deposition and then species numbers might decrease before they finally in really pure air um, increased dramatically. So it's still true, the highest species numbers are in the cleanest air, but when it goes to moderately polluted areas, that becomes a bit more uh, tricky. And then you have to look exactly what sort of species are there rather than just counting the species numbers. So that's a that's an excellent answer. So I I was going to ask you about the human pressures, but I think you've mentioned most of them. So pressure because we consume them and we collect them, and we might be collecting them too often. Uh, pressure because we are polluting the environment, and that can affect them in many ways. Um, what about climate change? How is climate change um, affecting them? Stary, I'm going to go uh, to you with this question. Yeah, well, it has been shown uh, recently that with the uh, warmer climate and I'm actually just witnessing it uh, when I uh, look out the window in, in Iceland that it's uh, making it uh, making better uh, better life for uh, shrubs and, and trees for example and in many cases in the heathlands uh, the further you get to the north then you are having higher shrubs and uh, more tree growth and that can actually outcompete the lichens that are growing on the ground in these in these areas. But that also uh, can also have effect when they are uh, uh, adapted to colder uh, colder climate, the lichens themselves. So it's not only maybe a question about the competition, although that might be a big part of it. <laughs> Anything to add to that, Holger? Anything else to to consider yes. as well? We're looking at climate change. Yeah, basically, uh, one important aspect to keep in mind is that climate change has direct and indirect effects. And one indirect effect is that by um, pushing up the temperatures, uh, weather intensity um, also uh, um, becomes more extreme. So in Europe, we see more flash floodings, more catastrophic uh, um, style uh, weather events, and that uh, affects the stability of entire landscapes. And the problem with lichens is they tend to be slow growing, and this instability um, that does have an effect on uh, populations of lichens. They cannot that easily recover. Um, and this is basically um, also a, a general pattern with regards to lichens and uh, the conservation of lichens. Because they are in general rather slow growing, they require slow environments. And uh, we are living in a time where uh, our land use is um, are optimized for quick turnovers and that's exactly what lichens don't like. So um, this is one of the main threats uh, also in uh, all parts of uh, our life. Agriculture is optimized for quick uh, return. Forestry has become a major issue worldwide for the survival of um, slow growing lichens. Um, we have indicator species for old growth forests. Old growth forests cannot be replaced um, quickly by uh, replacement plants, uh, plantations of uh, trees. So um, it's always the same story. 
lichens require slow environments basically absolutely now we've reached the end of the show study and holger but i want to ask you uh to to wrap it up completely uh after we've seen all the all the pressures that they're suffering can you tell us uh in a few words how can we protect uh, lichens obviously we need to do a global effort to stop climate change but individually is there anything uh that we can do i'm gonna go to study first and then to holga yeah well maybe for the first first point is to to show uh, reluctancy when you are if you are a lichen consumer as a, as myself <laughs> that i have to show some reluctancy when i'm collecting lichens for consumption but we also have to make sure that we have uh, areas with high uh, variation of lichens that are uh, conserved and uh, we are having areas big enough for uh, their uh, for their over uh, for their survival absolutely and holger what about what about you what would what advice would you give us view and people watching to protect yeah. them I think a very simple strategy, uh, even at the individual level, which everybody can do, is simply keep in mind, um, be tolerant to time requiring organisms. So if you have a, even a small back garden, um, just if you have trees there, let them grow old. Um, if you have wooden fences, don't replace them by metal fences. Um, enjoy the uh, organismic diversity which develops there. It's food for all sorts of other organisms as well. Just be tolerant and enjoy um, the slow growing um, organisms around you. And that is really something which everybody can apply in almost every aspect of our lives. And that would certainly uh, facilitate uh, a more a uh, peaceful um, living together of uh, us with the rest of our environment. That's a lovely message, uh, Holger and Estari. Just enjoy the slow uh, living life forms. Um, and with that, uh, we've reached the end of the show. I'm going to say thank you so much, Holger and Estari, for joining us today. Thank you as well for everyone watching, uh, as well as sending your questions. Those were excellent questions. Now, Holger, Estari, thank you so much. I'm going to say goodbye to you now. Bye bye. So, bye. Yeah, bye, -bye. <laughs> Now, thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoy the show and want to support the work that we do at the Natural History Museum, consider making a donation. You can do it directly on YouTube by clicking on the button next to the chat or going to our website and we'll put a link. Um, thank you so much for your questions. They were excellent. And uh, that's for all from us today. And in fact, in 2021, this was our last show of uh, the year. But don't worry, because we have loads of content ready for you for the new year. Stay, stay tuned. Check our social media channels and our website. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll be back in 2022. Uh, bye bye.